Okay, good morning, everybody. It has been an eventful morning, indeed, at least in my house, it has. So, <laughs> well, let me just put it this way. If, if you haven't caught vomit in your hands this morning, you haven't had the morning I've had, all right? So, because I think you should all know, all right? That's just it's the kind of morning I'm having. So, we are moving right along in the larger catechism. Um, so, if you remember the last two weeks, we examined uh, the miracle of the virgin birth, the hypostatic union... Um, and the importance of this doctrine is going to come to light uh, as we examine our question this morning. Uh, today we're on question 38, and we're looking at why man's mediator has to be God. And then, of course, the next question, question 39, is going to be why the mediator has to be man. The question after that is going to be why the mediator has to be both God and man in one person. So these three questions are really going to uh, go together. And if you haven't noticed by now, catechism is very systematic in its approach in teaching these truths, right? One idea naturally builds upon the next. So let me open us up in prayer. <clears throat> Our good and gracious Father, we thank you for uh, this truth that we find in Scripture. We thank you that it is uh, indeed so systematically preserved for us uh, in our confession. And we thank you that we um, can pray uh, in the name of our great mediator, our Lord Jesus Christ, that he is both God and man and that we can uh, learn about these great truths this morning. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so let's, uh, I'll read the question, and let's read the answer together. Why was it requisite that the mediator should be God? It was requisite that the mediator should be God, that he might sustain and keep the human nature from sinking under the infinite wrath of God and the power of death. Give worth and efficacy to his sufferings, obedience, and intercession.